And while they make their way to the back, if you would take your copy of Scripture and turn with me to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. And we're going to read verses 1 through 25, and then m- many of your translations will have also verse 26. Mark chapter 11, beginning there in verse 1. You can follow on the screen behind me if you choose to do that. Reading from the English Standard Version. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the coat? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the coat to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David! Hosanna in the highest! And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. And on the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see it if he could, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. And when they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sowed and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables and the money changers and the seats of those who sowed pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed is withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, Whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. And then verse 26 would have been, but if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Let's pray together. Now, our Father, we thank you for the privilege it is to be able to come to this text of Scripture. We ask that you would help us on this Palm Sunday to see the beauty and the majesty, the glory of the Lord Jesus. Help us to see him as King and Savior, prophet, priest. Father, help us to just be enthralled by uh, the uh, courage, by the commitment of the Lord Jesus to go all the way to death for sinners such as us. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I know that you're familiar with this passage of Scripture, at least the scene that you see here in verses 1 through 11. This is Palm Sunday, and so it's the Sunday that we celebrate the arrival of Jesus to the city of Jerusalem. And we want to look at that this morning. And that's going to really be one of the three scenes that we're going to consider this morning. We're going to consider one scene, the first scene, out of Mark chapter 10. And so just hold your place there in Mark 11, Mark 11 rather, and to turn to Mark 10 and hold your place there. And the first scene that we're going to see is the courageous determination of Jesus to fulfill the will 
of the Father. The courageous determination of Jesus to fulfill the will of the Father. And that'll be verses 32 through 34 of chapter 10. But then we come to this second scene that we just read, really the second and the third scene. The second scene is this clear demonstration of Jesus to fulfill the word of the Father. That's chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. The clear demonstration of Jesus to fulfill the word of the Father. And then finally, the last thing that we're going to see is the certain declaration of Jesus to fulfill the judgment of the Father. And that's verses 12 through 25. And perhaps as we read that text, you saw that scene in which the fig tree is cursed, and oftentimes you had wondered what is going on there. What in the world is Jesus doing? Is this some kind of childish fit of rage against the fig tree in which it wasn't even the season for figs? What is he doing? And we're going to try to answer that question for you. You're going to see that this is no just um, unthought of or um, disconnected writing. What Mark records for us all fits together. And there's a purpose for Jesus cursing the fig tree that has to do with his arrival in the city of Jerusalem. And so all this is laid out for us And I hope and pray that it will give some encouragement to you for the appreciation of who Jesus is in his humanity, what he did. I really want us to leave this morning with just a a recognition of the majesty, the beauty, um, the, uh, the glory of the Lord Jesus. I don't really have any specific, hey, do this as an application this morning. I just want us to see the unfolding of the last week of Jesus' earthly life. And there we go back to Mark chapter 10. And we see here in Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 34, the third time that Jesus predicts his death, burial, and resurrection to the disciples. It's the third time. He did it in chapter 8, verses 31, 32, and 33. He did it in chapter 9, verses 30 through 32, and now here Mark records for us the third time. Now he's emphasizing this because his disciples, remember, don't have any understanding of what he is going to be doing as the true Messiah. The Messiah that has really been revealed in Scripture, it's been taught and it's been uh, communicated, though the Jews never really comprehended it. They're still looking for this political, military a Messiah, who's going to come and set up a society of freedom and blessing and honor for the nation of Israel. And so Jesus now is communicating, he's got a different kind of Messiah. In fact, he's going to suffer and die. He's not the Messiah that they think he is. They've misunderstood, they have preconceived ideas, all their uh, suppositions that they've gained from bad teaching and bad understanding through their whole life has led them to believe something different than what the Scripture really has said about the Messiah. Now he's saying, listen, the Messiah is going to set up a kingdom that is spiritual, not political. We're not going to set you free from Rome. We're going to set you free. I'm going to set you free from your sins. And it's a different kind of kingdom. So notice what it says here in chapter 10, verse 32. And they were on the road. Remember I told you last Sunday morning, the pathway that is given to us as Mark writes down Jesus' journey to Jerusalem for that last week. So they're on the road going up to Jerusalem. Jesus was walking ahead of them. Jerusalem is a higher elevation. And so literally, it shows you the detail, the accuracy of Mark under the inspiration of the Spirit. They are literally walking up to Jerusalem on the road. And notice that Jesus is ahead of them. He's in the lead. And they were amazed. That is, the disciples were amazed. And those who followed were afraid. That is, the rest of the crowd. (coughs) There is both amazement and fear 
as those who are with Jesus on the road to Jerusalem are with him, they're amazed because of his determination, his clear, courageous determination to go to the cross. Even though they don't understand exactly what Jesus has said about himself, what they do understand is that for centuries, the prophets have been killed in Jerusalem. And Jesus has said something about going and suffering and dying. And they're not quite putting all the pieces of the puzzle together. It's like trying to put the jigsaw puzzle together without the box lid to give you any kind of frame of reference. And so they're trying to put all this together, dying and prophets dying in Jerusalem, and they're amazed that Jesus is so determined to carry out this trip to Jerusalem. What's going to happen there? We don't know. We're amazed at him, though. We can't believe that he's doing this. We don't understand why he's doing this. And then there's fear mixed in with that amazement. But what's going to happen to us if we go with you? If you go to Jerusalem and you suffer like you say that you're going to do, and there's this dying, and we don't even know what you're talking about. We're rising again. We have no concept in our mind for that. There's no space that we have, because we've never seen that. We don't understand what that is. So there's fear and there's amazement. And Jesus is out in front. He's leading the way. Listen, if you ever think that Jesus was some man be pamby wimp in his physical humanity, just scratch that off your list and your understanding. He was courageous in his humanity. He knew what Roman crucifixion was. He knew from the scripture what was going to happen to him and how he would be abused and rejected and reviled and how he would have to take the scourging that Pilate would decree and how he would have to go and then have to suffer on that cross. He knew that and he's not backing down. He's out in front. I'm going. I'm going all the way. And I'm going to bring redemption for these people that I love. And so taking the twelve again, taking the twelve aside, he says to them again, you're confused, you're, you're amazed, you're afraid, and he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, see, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priest. That is the temple priest and the scribes, those who record the law, And they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. Now, this is new information that Jesus is adding to his foretelling of his death. He says they're going to condemn him to death, but they're also going to turn him over to the Gentiles. It's not just going to be the chief priests and the scribes involved, but it's going to be the Gentiles as well. And they will mock him and they will spit on him, and they will flog him, and they will kill him. This is what awaits Jesus in Jerusalem, and he's out in front. He's out in front. And after three days, he will rise. So see here the the courageous determination of Jesus as he goes to Jerusalem to fulfill the will of the Father. The will of the Father had been that he would call a people to himself. And those people would have to come to him, not in their own righteousness, not in their own strength, not under their own merit, but they would have to come to the Father through what the Son would accomplish for those people. And so the Father would choose a people from all time, from eternity past, and the Son would come and redeem those people because they cannot save themselves. They cannot do anything to commend themselves to God. So Jesus comes and he fulfills the law perfectly, the law that God demanded that you must fulfill perfectly in every way to have a right relationship with him. Knowing that none of us could do it, but Jesus came and he did it perfectly without sin. And then he went all the way courageously determined to go to the cross and suffer the death that we all deserve because we can't fulfill the law. And the penalty of law-breaking is death. And the wages of sin is death. And so Jesus goes to Jerusalem 
to suffer and die the death that was necessary for those people that God elected to be saved. And then God takes the work of the Savior, this work that we're reading about right here, and He applies it in time. The Spirit applies that in time. 1963, 1972, 1918, 1833. Whenever it was that that a person would hear the gospel and they would repent and believe in that gospel and they would be saved, that's the work of the Spirit. The wind blows wherever it wants to blow. And he, he, the Spirit, works in such a way to draw a person to faith in Christ. Otherwise, you're not coming. Otherwise, you'll, you'll never come. And so you see salvation is a Trinitarian work. It's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And you see that Jesus is determined to go and fulfill the will of the Father by dying the death that he didn't deserve. He broke no law but he goes to die the death that we deserve. Now, we come down to the second scene. Chapter 11, verse 1. This is really a marvelous scene. I know you're familiar with it. And here's we see, here we see the clear demonstration of Jesus to fulfill the word of the Father. Not just the will of the Father, but the word of the Father. And here's what I mean when I say that. This is a complete fulfillment of several Old Testament prophecies. So Jesus comes to Jerusalem. He's now going to manifest himself publicly. Remember, this is not his pattern. Remember that many times as we read through the Gospels, what we see is Jesus saying, uh, see to it that you say nothing to anyone. But now, for the first time, he gives full vent to the people. And he says, I'm going to manifest myself as the king, the one promised in the Old Testament, the one who is demonstrating by his life that he's fulfilling all the prophecies that were given about the Messiah. I am he. And your king comes, Jerusalem. Your king is here, Jewish people. He comes and he's going to fulfill perfectly everything that is written about him in the Old Testament. For example, I want you to put your finger there in Mark and just turn to Genesis chapter 49 for a moment. And I want you to see a text here that is a fulfillment of what we see in Mark 11, 1 through 11. And I promise you we'll get to scene 3 in just a moment. But I want you to just see this text with me. And in our Mark scene, we read about the coat that is being provided, the coat of a donkey that was tied there at the doorway outside in the street, and the disciples that were sent came and untied it, and there was a questioning about what was happening, and Jesus had given them the words, that is, the disciples, the words that they should say when they are questioned. Well, look, this is a fulfillment in of uh, Genesis chapter 49, looking at verses 10 and 11. 10 and 11. This is a prophecy, a word of blessing spoken by Jacob over his sons. And in this text, we're looking at the blessing spoken about Judah. And in the line of Judah is Jesus. And notice what it says in verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, that is the ruler staff from between his feet. The ruler will always come from Judah, and Jesus is from the tribe of Judah until tribute or Shiloh comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Notice verse 11 binding his foe to the vine and his donkey's coat to the choice vine. He has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. Now, even though it may seem a little vague, and I know it's not as clear perhaps as we'd like to see it, but here Jesus is untying this coat as a son, the one who is the ultimate ruler of Judah. And he now has 
come to fulfill this prophecy in public as the people are watching and there is a king now who is arriving. The one who has prophesied in Genesis is now here in Jerusalem. Not only that, but we have the same kind of fulfillment as we read Zechariah. You don't have to turn to Zechariah chapter 9, but it's the same promise that is given there that your king, Jewish people, your king is going to arrive on the coat of a donkey. He's going to arrive in the town on the coat of a donkey. And, and, and what's amazing about the text in Zechariah, and again, I've asked you, you don't have to turn there, but if you do, I think you'll see something that is important that I, I just want to make a, a, a note about. In Zechariah chapter 9, l- listen to these verses. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a coat, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. It's a prediction of the one who is going to come, the king of the Jews who's going to come, and it's not going to be some kind of military power. He's going to come to, by the blood of his covenant, set people free from hell. That's why he's coming. And see, again, this is just a prediction of the word of the Father. Jesus is fulfilling this clearly. Notice what the people say, beginning there in verse 9, and those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, that is, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is a fulfillment of Psalm 118. There the people cry out the same kind of words, the language is the same, as the Davidic king comes into the temple to worship in Psalm 118. So it is here that people take those very words of Psalm 118, they apply them to Jesus in this circumstance because they recognize, at least superficially, that Jesus is doing what Psalm 118 prophesies. Not only that, but they say in their wording, verse 10, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. They recognize that Jesus is the one who from the house of David will reign on the throne forever. What he's fulfilling there is 2 Samuel chapter 7. Remember, David said, I want to build a house for you, Lord. And Nathan the prophet said, that's a good idea. And then Nathan went home, and the Lord told Nathan the prophet, hey, David can't do it. He's a man of bloodshed. I'll let his son do it. So Nathan went back to David and said, you can't do it. You're a man of bloodshed. David said, okay, well, I'll get all the material. I'll get, store up the silver, the gold, the, every kind of material that's needed for the building of the tabernacle. And David uh, and Brother Nathan said, and by the way, David, there's one other thing that the Lord said. The Lord said, it's good that you want to build a house for me, but I'm going to build a house for you. And you will always have a son on the throne. Doesn't mean there won't be a break, but you'll always have a son on the throne, and you will have your ultimate son who will reign on the throne in the kingdom of righteousness and justice and peace and security, and that's Jesus. And this is what Jesus is doing in chapter 11 of Mark. He's coming in to the city of Jerusalem. He's saying the one that is promised in 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 16, that's me. That's me. The one that you read about that that David is going to have a one who is going to be on the throne, a son who is going to be on the throne forever and his kingdom will be perfect. That's me. It wasn't Solomon. It wasn't any other descendant of David. But it's me. 
I'm publicly testifying to this reality. And not only that, but there's so much here. Remember, just at the end of chapter 10, by the way, just remember what happens when, look at it with me, chapter 10 of Mark. They came to Jericho. And while they were in Jericho, there was a blind beggar by the, same, by the name of Bartimaeus who received his sight. You know what one of the, the, the messianic understanding for the Jews was? That this son of David would come and he would give sight to the blind. I mean, just a few hours before Jesus comes and says, I'm that one, he had given sight to a blind man. And all those Galilean um, um, Passover crowd, they're with Jesus. They see it in Jericho. They're the ones who are following before and behind. They're the ones who are crowding around Jesus. And Jesus is on the coat of the donkey and he's riding in Jerusalem. And verse 11 says he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And we looked around at everything as it was already late. And he went out to Bethany with the twelve. He looked around. There's several times that we see in Scripture where Jesus looks around. One of those times, remember when he's in the synagogue and the man with the withered hand comes in? And Jesus says um, to all of those uh, sanctified religious Jewish men in their synagogue, um, what should I do about this man with the withered hand? They said, can't do anything. It's Sabbath. And the scripture said, Jesus looked around at them. He looked at them. And I think Jesus' look must have been a look of, um, this is serious business, right? I think when Jesus went to the temple, he looked around. And he knew exactly what he was about to do. Because all through the Old Testament, I haven't brought it out to you, but all through the Old Testament, there's this connection with the king and the temple. Particularly in the Psalms, we see it, this connection with the king and the temple. Now Jesus has come into town, and now as the king, he's going to do something with the temple. And that's where we come into this story of the fig tree. So let's look at this last scene. This is the certain declaration of Jesus to fulfill the judgment of the Father. We've already seen the courageous determination of Jesus to fulfill the will of the Father. Now, secondly, we see the clear demonstration of Jesus to fulfill the word of the Father. But now, this last certain declaration of Jesus to fulfill the judgment of the Father. So on the following day, remember they have arrived at Jerusalem. It's late. They go to Bethany. And on the following day, when they're coming back into Jerusalem, this is the last week of Jesus' life, so this is going to be the second day that he's in Jerusalem. He is um, coming in from Bethany, and he's hungry. Boy, there's so much we can unpack about that. This is what makes Jesus the great high priest. He knows what it is to be hungry. He knows what it is to be tired. He knows what it is to be tempted. He knows what it is to be human. So when you go to him and say, Lord, in my humanness, I'm struggling. Jesus says, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. And he intercedes for us. But we don't have time to unpack all that. He was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. Well, it's not the season of figs. It turns out that in that day and time, there could have been um, the first few figs on the tree, but that's not the point. That's not the point at all. What Jesus is doing, he's setting up a prophetic illustration. He's about to demonstrate what's about to happen to the temple. That he, Jesus himself, is going to be the new temple. And the old temple brick and mortar stone temple is about to be destroyed. And so he curses this fig tree. He said, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. It's not that Jesus is having a fit of rage here. It's not 
He's against a fig tree. He's demonstrating what he, the king, is about to do to this religious temple and all of its legalistic, unbiblical teaching and its bondage that it puts people in. He, he's not just cleansing the temple. That's how we understand it normally. He is coming in to destroy what the temple represents. Now, the temple literally will be destroyed by the Romans in a few years from this point, but Jesus is coming to destroy what the temple represents, and he's saying, I'm the new temple. Remember what he said? Destroy this temple and three days I'll rise again. He's talking about the temple of his body. Remember John records that for us? He's the new temple. So Jesus curses this fig tree for it to be an illustration of the temple. And now we have what we call in um, hermeneutics a sandwich. So the sandwich is the fig tree is cursed. And then we have this picture of Jesus going into the temple and running out the money changers. And then we come back to the lesson of the fig tree. So fig tree, temple, fig tree. That's how you need to read your Bible. That's how you need to understand. These are not disjointed, disconnected stories. There's a purpose in everything that Mark has recorded, and there's a linear thought here. And he says, uh, or rather they come into Jerusalem, and now he enters the temple for the second time on the second day, and he drives out those who sowed and those who bought in the temple. He overturned the tables and the money changers and the seats of those who sowed pigeons. He's cursing the temple. He's cursing the temple and what the temple represents. Just as he cursed the fig tree. Verse 17, 17 says, And he was teaching them and he was saying to them, My house shall be called a house of prayer. That's a quote from Isaiah chapter 56. And in Isaiah chapter 56, God is saying to all the foreigners that they can come to the temple and they can worship God. And his house will be called a house of prayer for the nations. And this is what Jesus is referring to then here. It's not a religious market so you can come and buy and sell and buy your sacrifice and make sure that you get the unblemished sacrifices. It's not about all of that. All that is done with. It's cursed. We're done. I'm the new temple. There's a new way. And so he says, you've made it a den of robbers. That's a quote from Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11, where we see in the Old Testament the fact that the people would do their sin, justify it by going to the temple and somehow do their religious duty and they're protected and safe because of the temple. And Jesus said, you sin and you run to the temple. You think the temple is the way, but it's not the way. You think you're safe at the temple, but the temple is cursed. And of course, the response is that the religious, religious leaders want to kill him. They seek to destroy him. Uh, and by the way, this is the first of three different times that Mark records for us this same kind of plan. That is that these religious leaders would seek to destroy Jesus, kill him. You see it in chapter 12, verse 12. You see it in chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. But all the crowd is astonished at his teaching, so they're afraid. That is, the religious leaders are afraid. And so when evening came, they went out of the city. Now, this text has been used to somehow justify being angry and all kinds of misunderstandings and misapplications of this text. But now you see there's a reason. He's destroying the works of the temple and it was cursed just like that fig tree. The fig tree becomes an a, um, object lesson. And that's typical in the Old Testament. I mean, Isaiah had to run around naked. Um, Ezekiel had to sleep on his side for like a year. 
I mean, there's all kinds of ways that God pictured his prophecies. This cursing of the fig tree is a picture of the cursing of the temple and its religion. So now we come to our last section of this third scene, verse 20. And as they pass by in the morning, this is now the third day of the last week of Jesus' life, and they saw the fig tree weathered away to its roots. And, of course, Peter um, points it out, and there's the teaching then that Jesus gives about the temple uh, and about his being the temple. So, look, he says, um, Peter said, the fig tree that you cursed is withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Mount Zion, mount the mount on the temple that it's built, this is not talking about some cancer diagnosis, some emergency, some crisis, something like that. Certainly pray, but this is not the text for that. When, whoever says to this mountain, this, this mountain that the temple is built upon, be taken up and thrown into the sea. And what we see over and over again in the Gospel of Mark is the fact that the sea becomes a picture of destruction. You remember all the pigs, the herd of pigs that ran off into the sea? This is what this is saying. This temple and its religious system is going to be thrown off in the sea. Jesus is the one who is saying to this mountain, and you can trust God at his word that he's going to destroy this religious, sense, this religious sense, uh, system, this temple as it is. And guess what? The new temple is going to be a spiritual temple. It's going to be composed of two things, prayer and forgiveness. Prayer and forgiveness. That's what's going to distinguish the old temple from the new temple. The new temple is my body. Those who by faith come to me, those who repent and believe, those who would understand the gospel and come to saving faith, they will have a spiritual life and that spiritual life will be characterized in part by prayer and forgiveness. That's what he's saying. So see, all of this is connected. This is one long piece of Mark recording for us the beauty, the majesty, the wonder, the greatness of Jesus. This is what he's done for us. This is why we come to this table. This is why we celebrate who he is. Now what is missing from all of this are those people in the crowd as he rides into Jerusalem, the people that perhaps were in the temple as he was teaching. What is missing from those people are the repentant people. There are none. There are no repentant people. There are none. So don't, don't let that be true of this service this morning. Don't be one of those who is unrepentant. Come to faith in Christ. Believe in Him. Repent and receive the salvation that is provided for you. This bread and this cup that we're about to receive represent the sacrifice that he made for you. And so, would you believe that? Trust in that? Wholeheartedly give your weight and trust to that? Be thankful that God did away through Jesus the sacrificial system and all that religious superficiality of the temple system? And it comes down to Jesus? And resting in what he's done? Have faith in that. Would you believe that? Would you repent and be saved today? Immediately following the service, I'll be in the back. I'll be glad to talk with you. And for those of us who are believers, let's come to this table with joy. Let's come with thanksgiving. Let, let's come, I hope, as I prayed and I said earlier, at the beginning of our time, I pray that we can walk out of this sanctuary this morning seeing with new eyes the glory and the majesty of Jesus. Come back Friday night and we'll celebrate the crucifixion together. Come back next Sunday morning and we'll celebrate the resurrection.
Let me pray for us.